Zechariah chapter 9, a revelation. Yahweh's word is against the land of Hadrach and will rest on Damascus. For the eye of man and all of the tribes of Israel is toward Yahweh. And Hamath also which borders on it Tyre and Sidon because they are very wise. Tyre built herself a stronghold and heaped up silver like the dust and fine gold like the mire of the streets. Behold, the Lord will dispossess her. He will strike her power in the sea and she will be devoured with fire. Ashkelon will see it and fear. Gaza also will writhe in agony, as will Ekron, for her expectation will be disappointed. And the king will perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon will not be inhabited. Foreigners will dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. I will take away his blood out of his mouth, and his abominations from between his teeth. And he also will be a remnant for our God, and he will be as a chieftain in Judah, and Ekron as a Jebusite. I will encamp around my house against the army that no one pass through or return, and no oppressor will pass through them any more, for now I have seen with my eyes. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes to you. He is righteous, and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be cut off and he will speak peace to the nations and his dominion will be from the sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of your covenant, I have set free your prisoners from the pit in which is no water. Turn to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today I declare that I will restore double to you. For indeed, I bend Judah as a bow for me. I have filled the bow with Ephraim, and I will stir up your sons, Zion, against your sons, Greece, and will make you like the sword of a mighty man. Yahweh will be seen over them, and his arrows will flash like lightning, and the Lord Yahweh will blow the trumpet and will go with whirlwinds of the south. Yahweh of armies will defend them, and they will destroy and overcome with sling stones. And they will drink and roar as though wine. And they will be filled like bowls, like the corners of the altar. Yahweh their God will save them in that day as the flock of his people. For they are like the jewels of a crown, lifted on high over his land. For how great is his goodness, and how great is his beauty. Grain will make the young men flourish, and new wine the virgins. All right, so the book of Zechariah changes tack <laughs> in this chapter. So it's like a sailing ship going along and you know sailing ships tack maybe you don't and i'm not a sailor but i just know that when you want to sail into the wind you know like when you're sailing away you just put up your sail and the wind blows and off you go when you want to sail into the wind you've got to tack which means you go you set the angle and so you're sailing this way and then this way and then this way and then this way and each one of those is called a tack yep well the book of zachariah changes tack in this chapter in other words it's kind of like doing a different thing and so up to this point we had all these really apocalyptic um, visions you know like the flying scroll and the the wicked woman in the basket and the the colored horses which i didn't know what they meant and um, <laughs> we had all those vi and then in the last two chapters we've had a prophecy but now it's like it's like we're kind of in the book of Isaiah again. It's something changed. And Bert Kaufman, the, one of the commentators I read a lot, he said, the book has now become messianic, or it's taken on a messianic tone. And I thought about that. In, in other words, he's saying it's now about Jesus. But I've been describing all these things that have all been about Jesus through all of the chapters up to this point. It's, it's not suddenly becoming messianic. It's been messianic all along. It's all about Jesus. Now, in this chapter, there is some stuff about Jesus. <laughs> of course, that's why he said that. And the really obvious one is actually in verse 9, because this is what verse 9 says. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem, because your king comes to you. He is righteous, having salvation, lowly and riding on a, riding on a donkey, even on a cult, the foal of a donkey. Now, that verse, have you heard it anywhere before? Yes, you have. You've heard it on Palm Sunday 
when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, this is the verse that was quoted in the Gospels. It says, here's your king riding into you lowly, you know, humbly on, on a donkey. You know, like uh, if he was proud, he'd ride in on a horse like a warrior. But no, he's riding in humble on a donkey. So <laughs> th that verse that was quoted in the Gospels, it's right here in Zechariah chapter 9. And it's clearly Messianic. It's obviously about Jesus because it's quoted in the New Testament. But that doesn't mean that all the chapters before weren't about Jesus too. They were. And I was pointing out to you, like the symbol of the olive tree, you know, which appeared in chapter 5, I think it was chapter 5, that was clearly about Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is our olive tree. We're grafted into him. So there's like so many symbols all the way up to here about Jesus. So in that sense, the book hasn't changed tack. But in just, when you're reading it, it's just like it's written in a different style. It's like we're now really poetic, whereas before it was more like prose. So up to this point, it's like a narrative, like a story, you know, like an angel appeared and I saw this. But now it's like Isaiah, it's like poetry. So there's a change attack in like the style, but the content is still about Jesus. This chapter says, apart from the very obvious reference to Jesus on Palm Sunday, it says some other interesting things. So it talks to start with about some countries that are all around that are going to be destroyed. It says, Yahweh's word is against the land of Hadrach and will rest on Damascus. So that's the country of Syria. In verse uh, 2 and 3, it says, Tyre and Sidon. Tyre built a stronghold. It says some stuff about her. In verse 4, it says, The Lord will dispossess her and strike her power in the sea. She will be devoured with fire. So, and then verse 5, 6, 7 starts talking about that God's going to, punish the Philistines so it's talking about these countries Syria the Phoenicians the Philistines how they're going to be destroyed and they all were so from a historical point of view these prophecies were fulfilled like for example Alexander the Great comes down the coast from above like a hundred years after this and he gets to Tyre and Sidon and he does exactly what this prophecy says he strikes her in the sea and burns the city with fire that's what happens. It's like very described here, almost like literally. But as it's going on, describing all these nations that are going to be destroyed, it says this most interesting thing. It says that the Lord will strike. He says he will encamp against them. And then it says to rejoice, daughter of Zion. Now, I, I remembered um, in Psalm chapter 2... It says that the Lord was going to give the nations to his son. It says, ask of me and I will give you the nations. And it says, you will strike them with a rod of iron. And the word strike was appearing here, talking about striking nations. And you will rule them with a scepter of iron. Now, what is that rod of iron? It's the word of God. <laughs> He's going to strike them with his word. And it's his word that's going to change them. So we often think, because there was also like a physical fulfillment, you know, like the Phoenicians, the Philistines, they were actually destroyed. But there's also like a spiritual and a greater, ultimately more true fulfillment because the word of God strikes nations and they change. When the word of God enters into the hearts of people, they're different. So you think of like the Roman Empire and how proud it was and how cruel it was. But as Christianity became stronger, the words of Christ affected that empire, so it ended up becoming a Christian empire. It's like what we're seeing in India today, where Christianity is increasing and having a greater effect, so that in the past, Hindus would never have done things for the poor caste because they deserved it. But now, there are Hindu charities. <laughs> They've been affected by the words of Christ. So... You know, Christians come along, they feed the poor, they care for the lowly because Jesus said to do it. The words of Christ affect Christians. They behave and change their actions and has a flow-on effect on the world around them. So now even non-Christians care for the poor. The words of Christ are like an iron rod that have struck the nations and have an effect upon them. And it's an increasing effect. So it's what we see now is like a bit but it's going to be more and more and more like that. So uh, <laughs> uh, it's describing here like 
physical destruction, which happened in, in a historical sense, but it's also describing and the ultimate reality, which is also happening in history, but happening over a longer period of time and taking place as we speak. It says in verse 10, it says that God's going to, you know, uh, cut off the chariot from me from the horse from Jerusalem, the battle bow we cut, will be cut off, and he will speak peace. So what's, his, what's the peace of God? It's the gospel. He will speak peace. God, by the way, gospel is also called the gospel of peace. He will speak peace to the nation. See, that's the Great Commission. And his dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So as the gospel grows out, the dominion of the Lord spreads throughout the whole world. <laughs> it's describing it here, but if you read it with a very limited mind, you think there's going to be some like kind of empire, some kind of like physical empire that's going to rule. But no, the empire is the kingdom of God. And that is an empire. It's the king. He's the king of kings. There's no other kingdom like his. It's an eternal kingdom. His kingdom will last forever. <laughs> so that's what's being described. And it's super cool. And I want to describe one more verse here, which I think is wonderful. And it's verse 13. God says, I will bend Judah as a bow for me. I have filled the, ba the bow with Ephraim. And I will stir up your sons, Zion, against your sons, Greece, and make you like the sword of a mighty man. All right, well, this is what I think it means. <laughs> I think the Lord is going to take of Judah, in other words, of the church. The sons of Zion, by the way, is the church. Because out of Judah and out of Jerusalem comes those with real faith, the sons of Judah, and that's the church. It's the body of Christ. It's those who know the Lord. And the Lord's going to take them and bend them like a bow. In other words, they are going to become his weapon. And he's going to use them to fight against the sons of Greece. Now, what are the sons of Greece? It's the sons of worldly logic. So in the world, there are two great writing systems that have influenced things. There's the writing of the Jewish people, which is the Bible, and it's the writings of the Greeks, like Aristotle and Plato and all of this. You know, for example, people say, oh, we get democracy from the Greeks. You know, democracy is such a wonderful thing. Everyone gets a vote. Thank God for the Greeks. Well, there are good things that have come from the Greeks, but we actually don't get demo that. The type of democracy that we have that's a blessing doesn't actually come from the Greeks. If you go back to the Greek way of democracy, only rich, wealthy aristocrats were allowed to vote. No one else got a vote. So it wasn't the type of democracy we have. The type of democracy we have today comes from the idea that everyone's equal, and that's an idea we get from the Bible. The democracy we have in the world today comes because of the Bible, not because of Greek logic. So history, you know, you go to uni and they'll tell you, oh, it's so wonderful, we've got democracy, it's because of Greek logic. It's not, it's because of the Bible. And so there's this battle between Greek thinking and Bible thinking. And here the Lord says that the, the Bible thinking is going to win. <laughs> and uh, now I like Greek people and I've learned to read and write Greek as part of my New Testament studies. The Greek language is, is a, I can't, speak and talk in Greek. That's much harder to do when I'd like to. But um, we've got this cool verse that says that the, the, the Lord is going to bend the sons of Judah against the sons of Greece. In other words, the way, the way of thinking that the, comes from the Lord is going to defeat the way of thinking that comes from the world. And the Lord is going to have his strength displayed. So as we go along, the word of God, the Bible, has an effect. And that's the same symbol I mentioned earlier, the rod of iron. It's the same thing. And that is also the two-edged sword that comes out of the mouth of Jesus as he rides his white horse in the book of Revelation. That same picture going out to conquer the nations, same symbol. So finally, we finish this chapter with verse 17, which says this, How great is his goodness and how great is his beauty. And I have to say that is completely true. The Lord is marvelous. 
He is wonderful. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, but fills our hearts with his love and calls us to serve him and bring the blessing of his greatness and his love to the people around us. So let's join him in doing that. Lord, I thank you for this interesting chapter. Thank you for the change of tack, but also thank you for the wonderful truth in here. May we have grace to serve you. Lord, bend us as a bow of Lord, bend us as your bow. May we be your weapon. Use us for your purposes, I pray. Amen.